And we are recording. Mm -hmm. So uh, tonight, uh, I am pleased to be speaking with Scary Lady Sarah, who I've, I've known for a while. Um, and this will this will be a, a great conversation because we've only, you know, talked here and there um, at uh, events and stuff. So this will be great. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yeah. When did we meet? It's got to be 20 years. Ah, so I have a little something for that. Okay. Um, I actually met you in the 90s at NEO, and I have... Oh my gosh, that's my signature on it. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah, I would give those, I remember when I was tending bar there, um, yeah. people who were good customers, good tippers, I'd give them a free pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so this, that was the, I was stationed um, at in Wyoming at the time okay. and was just home uh, on, you know, short vacation, short leave. And one of our friends at their base in Wyoming was also from Chicago. And so when we all went, Chicago together uh she brought us over to Neo oh cool so that was the one time I'd gone there until I started going there regularly in like 99 or something like that okay yeah, yeah. I left there at the end of 96 yeah I think it was November 96 I believe okay yeah wow so that that helps me to know because I, I couldn't 100% remember if I, if it was on vacation when I went there or shortly after I moved back to Chicago, it might be shortly after because we moved back to Chicago in August of 96. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Cool. <laughs> A relic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you've used the name Scary Lady Sarah for obviously a long time. Uh, how did you come up with that name so gosh um like 1987 88 um some of my friends called me scary sarah and some of my friends called me lady sarah <laughs> and i just basically combined them um, i thought it was funny and i mm -hmm. even though I was a much more serious goth <laughs> back in my you know, early 20s. Um, I still had enough uh, self deprecate, depre what's the word? Uh, deprecation in there to make, yeah. to make it fun. You know, you can't take yourself too seriously. Right. Wow, what a sad way to go through life. But yeah, so I thought scary lady was funny and um, yeah. it stuck. <laughs> yeah, definitely stuck. Um, and it's, it's, you have on your Twitch um, 30 years again or something like that? So Nocturna, uh, well, I started DJing in clubs in 1988. I DJed a little bit of college radio before that, but in mm -hmm. 1988. So um, on the 30th anniversary of Nocturna a few years ago, I had intended to publish our book of basically a, a little memento and, and anecdotes and quotes from patrons from all eras and photos and flyer reproductions and calling it 30 years of nights but now it's i didn't finish it so now it's <laughs> what, 30 it's going to be 33 years i don't know i might have to come up with a completely different title for the 33 and a third years 33 and a third years perhaps yeah there you go so it's really me just not kind of buckling down and doing the enormous amount of scanning that is ahead wow. of me <laughs> i have collected and collected and i still get you know things sent to me sometimes that i don't have you know flyers and memorabilia uh, and it's 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 an enormous amount of yeah stuff. well as long as you don't take as long as george rr R. martin to get a book done <laughs> i don't know the story of this yeah story. It, that's uh, lord of the rings people have been or not lord of the rings i'm yeah, that's i I should. Okay. <laughs> um, um, <Somebody> the <laughs> HBO thing, and everybody right now is watching this and like typing in, in chat, like, you moron, don't you know what this is? It's. Uh... <laughs> is it oh my God, I can... I'll, I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> 
I have, I, yeah, I, I've always had this problem. There's like sometimes just words I cannot think of. No problem. Uh, I do the yeah. same. So. It's like it's the show with Jon Snow, and the book is the That's Song of Ice and Fire, and Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Which I have not <sighs> seen. I've yeah. never seen one episode of it, but if I obviously I can't yeah. escape knowing what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he's famous for um, taking forever to get a book out, so the TV show had to actually go past his books. Oh, I so. <laughs> yeah. I won't take that long. <laughs> well, we can look forward to a book someday. Yes, yes, at that's least cool. one. There's that's the Nocturna history book. That's one thing, and then there's a whole another book of of the the insane stories of of my life in the music and club industry. That yeah, I would love to to get out there. Well, you know what you should look at doing is uh, making it like a a video series. We have an idea. We we meaning William. My uh -huh. husband, William Faith, and I, um, once we finish our album, our is our band, the Bellwether Syndicate, mm -hmm. it's way, <laughs> way, 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 way late, way later than we said it was going to be done. Uh -huh. There's all kinds of issues that happen. But once that's finished, which will be fairly soon, then we actually want to start doing a video podcast okay. to tell all these stories. So, yeah, your idea Good. is... is our, our idea as well good uh i've been suggesting that to djs um because um i mean everybody can own the same music almost anybody can dj you know in terms of being able to play music sure. right um it's a little bit more skill to you know put together a good set and then more skill to 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 mix and you know all that um but what is what is absolutely unique are the individual experiences, right? So the individual stories that each person has, the individual connections to the music, right? Those yeah. are what are in business terms, you know, the unique value proposition. Um, and so I'm always trying to tell DJs to take more time to tell us stories and, and you do um, and some others do, uh, others, don't but yeah that's those are those are really really valuable hmm, i agree yeah i yeah. definitely agree i was actually um watching a twitch channel today a, a girl in chicago who was playing like classic goth and post-punk stuff and it was just a small little audience but we we're you know chatting away and having fun and i kept saying oh this band and then my stories i've basically she was doing 90s music for the most uh -huh. part and like I booked this band, I booked this band, I booked this band. And then of course have stories about them all. Um, and somebody in the chat said the same thing. You should, you should have a podcast. I'm like, well, gosh, I will. <laughs> well, I can share with you. Um, I had uh, the beginning of this year, I attended a conference that had some workshops. Uh, and one of them, one of the workshops was about how to basically package a series um, so if, if you wanted to create a podcast, there's, oh. there's a good way to do it. And then there's a bad way to do it. So sure. I could talk to you about that later. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was really interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I've already skipped over my opening question. Um, so we'll go back to it, okay. which was, <laughs> what does music mean to you? Music has been, I don't have a concise answer for this really, but it, is, it has been the thing that I honestly, and all the things, so did you, I don't know, did you hear that beep? <laughs> My laundry's done. <laughs> that it, it's been what has, what brought me, well, brought me through some, kept me alive. When I was a teenager, I was, very depressed mm -hmm. and um i don't think clinically he was you know situationally but i but i was and and finding music and then the things that accompanied it the subculture around mm -hmm. the music that i was interested in definitely uh, gave me a sense of purpose and belonging and, and direction 
and fun. And I haven't been that depressed teenager for a long time, but it's yeah. what the music has always remained. You know, the, the, the styles and genres have evolved and changed over time, but it's, it's just the best thing ever. I, I, I music is, is pretty much everything about my life. Every mm -hmm. single aspect that has shaped my life is somehow connected to music from all my relationships Mm -hmm. I'd say 99% of my friendships in my entire life have been because of going to, you know, meeting someone in a club because I went there because of the music or they went to mm -hmm. there because of the music or concerts or whatnot. Um, it's, it gives, you know, now I'm, I'm, I still consider myself a new musician, even though our band has been going for 10 years, but I, you know, I, I've always been as a DJ, I, I consider myself a more of a patron of the art. Now mm -hmm. I'm also the artist, at least to some degree. I don't give myself that much credit because William is really like the amazing maestro that he is, is he can you know, pick up anything and play it. I'm still struggling with guitar, <laughs> but, um, but now it, it's, 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 neat that it's opened up this whole other side of it to me as well so it's not just and i am i'm a, i'm consuming the music and, and mm -hmm. experiencing it i'm involved in the creative process too and so that's a whole new cool side uh, of of interest in my life how does that differ from from djing oh my gosh completely <laughs> um though i will say as because I've been a DJ for so long, mm -hmm. I also look at the music that we create and that I think about creating with a little bit of that DJ mindset as well. So I don't want to play music that's just stuff that I'm gonna, you know, I would hear in a club, in a goth club or an indie mm -hmm. club or whatever. But there is definitely an aspect of, of that that's important too, if, if we want to get it, you know, if Wait. we want people to listen to it and wouldn't right. play it, right, and just share it. Um, it's interesting with the, this Twitch era since the mm -hmm. coronavirus, you can you hear a lot of music that you may not hear in in clubs so often because it wouldn't be considered dance music, right? Per se, even the goth stuff. Um, so some of the things that you hear, it's it's people are appreciating the music more than just the danceability of it. Yeah. But boy. It's, I have, I've always, because music's always been so important to me, the, the most important thing really. Um, it's, I've always had an admiration for musicians, but now that I know how hard it is to play <laughs> an instrument, wow, do I admire people who just do it like, yeah. and it looks like effortless. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. You're putting your hands into these very unnatural <laughs> positions, right. yeah. and, and it hurts. <laughs> yeah. You can't keep your nails long, and you're, you know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> a million reasons. But uh, yeah, it's I love it though. It's fun when yeah. I do it right. I'm, 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 I'm I feel so uh, such a sense of wow of just joy. Yeah, yeah. So it, that that joy um, is that both when just just playing or in the creating both creating so again it's it's still fairly new to me i have some mm -hmm. i have some music i've put uh you know written myself that's mm -hmm. going to be on the new album um some you know, lyrics and things but it's it's a it's a learning process it doesn't mm -hmm. didn't come naturally to me at all i think there william disagrees with me but i think there's some people who are kind of born natural musicians you know, maybe they can't play the thing until they learn it, obviously, but but there's just an aptitude there that's, mm. you know, right on. Yeah. And for me, I had to struggle. So it is still a joy to come up with something that works. And also being on stage playing, I mean, I'm, I have no stage fright whatsoever, you know, yeah. being a DJ for so many years too, and then I'm a pretty outgoing person. <laughs> so, that's, but when you're on and you're playing and people are enjoying it and you can see that, ah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, I guess it's similar to the feeling when I play a song at a club and someone yeah. runs up and like, oh my God, what is this? This is amazing. You know, and you see that's yeah. so rewarding. But it's the same kind of feeling when I see people in the audience yeah. 
especially if they're singing along and they know your stuff. Wow. Right. It blew my mind the first time I saw that happen. I'm like, yeah. How did they know this. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, William's just like, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> but it's cool. <laughs> So how uh, how does that compare with um, you being on Twitch, right? Because you you're not the it, it's hard to obviously yeah. see that response, but you can see you know representation of it with the chat and the emoji right. and stuff like that. Yeah, it's definitely really reliant on the chat. Um, and it's strange. It's really weird. I'm still I I've never I had never gone on Twitch. I've never. I've never been into like video gaming or anything. So I have no idea about the terminology and the, the, the processes of how all that stuff works. So it's, it's still something I'm, you know, grappling with getting right. Um, but the, when the chat is up and running and, oh, it's, it's, it's really gratifying too. Our chats, I, I, I tell the people, the patrons, that I think we have this silliest, goth chats of any yep. goth stream and it's awesome i think that's for me that's a point of pride because it's it's just if people are just having fun yeah and you do feel a connectivity even though you know i'm in chicago you know you're in charleston somebody else is in hamburg someone is in portland someone you know whatever it's right it's, but you really feel this connection um i guess it's you know it's this thing that maybe younger people aren't so thrilled or surprised by if they do online gaming and you have that yeah. all the time but for me it's it's still a it's a trip right. yeah <laughs> um okay. and of course sometimes it's reflected in the you know the tips people leave which is you know very appreciated because uh, okay. I, I you know djing was my only job right <laughs> it was a job that I, I love and and i did have done for you know many many yeah. years but since since the since the Rona, it's yeah. uh, I've had to yeah pivot entirely to. So I realized ah I don't have a whole lot of other skills. <laughs> 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 I can work you know maybe at a I don't know a store or something. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I I owned a business yeah. totally unrelated yeah. business for twenty four years and right. all that is the, gone right now too. So the, like um immersion tanks or what do you call it? Flotation tanks. Flotation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's like, so I've been my own boss for yeah since from my whole adult life, and yeah. both of the industries are um, either gone at the moment or, you know, completely different. So yeah, well, you know, I I'm I'm always trying to remind people, you know, that that the DJs aren't there just doing it for fun, right? Which some of them are, but yeah, well, some of us, who but are some definitely not. Some <laughs> definitely rely on. And that is as, as an income. And that's why I um, got into pushing hype trains. And then I got addicted to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, I thank you. <laughs> yeah. And then and then I told Margaret how much I spent. And now. <laughs> Are you in trouble? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm cutting back. Okay. Uh, but I still have my emotes. So, uh, yeah, cool. I got that. Um, and I try, I'm hoping that this series of, of interviews and all that helps in some way um, that people learn a little bit more about the DJs, feel a little mo more connected and then mm -hmm. maybe more willing to, to give, um, you know, bits and tips and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then hopefully because I'm pulling from a lot of different DJs that will get some more, you know, transfer, of uh, you know, of fans, you know, uh, spreading that way yeah. um, I don't expect to have a huge impact from that but any, any little bit helps it does I I again I sincerely appreciate it I'm uh, just speaking for myself I'm sure that other DJs feel the same way yeah uh, it's yeah it's it's a uh, it's been mind-blowing <laughs> to say yeah. the least I just think goodness that we have this up uh, you know platform to use right during this time, you know, I don't know if there were that many nightclub DJs during the, the Spanish flu, you know, the last major right. world <laughs> pandemic, but you know, if there was, uh, I'd have been fucked, <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, even 10 years ago, yeah. this wouldn't have been yeah. possible. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like 
uh, after 9-11 and people were staying indoors, right? There, was, there wasn't there was an online thing for people to go and enjoy music. Right. right? So I'm, I'm sure then there was a, a big dip in, you know, clubs and stuff. We, it's funny that you mentioned 9-11 because we, in all the years of Nocturna, there was only one night where I had to cancel mm. and 9-11 happened on a Tuesday mm. and we, of course, yeah. Metro was closed and that was the one and only time and uh, some people showed up because they didn't know. Right. And I had a sign on the door saying, if you want to, we're all at this bar down the street, if you want to just gather and be yep. with people tonight rather than be alone and sit there and you know in shock which we can we can all sit in shock together and it's yep. better um and we did it was it was a i'll never forget obviously that oh yeah it was pretty intense um thankfully at least to, to my events it didn't seem to put people uh off from going out right okay I, maybe other places yeah yeah because that was uh, there was the term back then was called cocooning and uh -huh. people were just staying in and that's sure. when um things like netflix started really taking off because people were staying home um and the just as a complete side note here <laughs> but um that led also to surprisingly people are staying home but having fewer babies huh. um <laughs> so universities have like for the last two years been looking at the plunge of if you look at the demographics there was a there's a sharp drop in the number of 18 year olds that will be entering college and right. so before this pandemic colleges were already worried about how we're going to survive um and now with the pandemic it's even worse so wow i didn't know that but yeah and and so understanding that um and the impact that that had um i i knew early on that this pandemic was going to have a substantial impact on our lives yeah. for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, and, and we, we, you know, you've talked about this before about, you know, the discovering this medium of streaming um, and planning on continuing it, I think when, when we get to be able to go to clubs again right you see yourself doing yeah, that yeah. I think, yeah i definitely i think i don't want to just i don't want to do it too much because i don't want to discourage people from coming to my club mm -hmm. nights in chicago and i have always I, I don't like staying in. i mean i'm fine staying in with you know mm -hmm. now and i never get tired of the company of my husband or my cat so that's fine but i you know my reason <laughs> for anything i do is is to, to connect with people in real life too yeah. and and being and i i thought in the when when usenet was a thing you know kind of pre-social media and, mm -hmm. and the, the boards there in the late 90s mid to late 90s i was uh often really critical of people who seem to just stay in and talk rather than you know talk about goth things but not going out right. i understand there's all myriad of reasons why somebody may not go out to you know distance you know if they don't mm -hmm. live in a major city or maybe a, a you know a physical reason or or social anxiety or but those things aside <laughs> uh, it's just you're not it's not really a subculture or a scene if it's contained to the internet i i, I want to be out and i want people right to be, it's just as cool as it is to do Twitch and the, the love and connectivity I feel in the chat doesn't hold a candle to when you're actually in a club. Yeah. And you, but, the same you know, when you look at how many people cannot access a club for those reasons, it really is a lot. I mean, right. if you think about um, the amount of space, the amount of towns and small cities that you know, just in the U.S. that, yeah. you know, are not going to have a golf club. I mean, here in Charleston, we had we had something going once a month. Uh, then there was like two a month. And then it then there was none. Oh. And it just turned into um, once a month, we we gathered a bar and take over the 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 music for right. a few <laughs> hours, you know, so it's yeah. Um, so this is completely different. This is this is great. Yeah. Um, 
And then of course, like you mentioned, you know, people with anxiety um, and that has been skyrocketing yeah, um, for sure. nowadays. Uh, so I, I don't expect that to go down much. So I, 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 I'm hoping to see that DJs find um, that it's worthwhile to do because I, 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 being business professor, see opportunities for additional revenue streams this way. Mm -hmm. Right. So right now, and Twitch, it's free, and you're you're, you know, expecting or you're hoping for you know those tips and everything. Uh, but there's a lot of other platforms being developed that would sure. allow. Right. So, so Make Cloud just went out from their pro beta. They just actually streamlined it and went straight past the beta to do the same thing, which is good. It just, I, and I had a pro account there for a while too, but it just doesn't, it's still, it's not as fun <laughs> as what? the Twitch. I think it'll get better. I'll probably, What's the platform? Oh, Mixcloud. Oh, Mixcloud, okay. Yeah. 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 And I definitely, I absolutely see the, the point of what you're saying. And I, and I love, I love the connection with people. I feel like are almost, you know, Part of our little posse now that yeah. I've not met in person. I know there are a lot of people I've met in person that live far away and that we, you know, we, they join our chats and whatnot. But, but I, at the same time, I have to be cognizant of not only for my own personal enjoyment, but for my income too, keeping, making sure people go to Nocturna when it's at Metro. That's, right. that's like, that's my main income right, right. there that night. So I can't, I am, we're, we're squeaking by right now. Right. And I mean, squeaking. <laughs> it's, yeah. it is, uh, and we'll go into too much detail, but it's, it's very precarious um, yeah. as far as our, like being able to pay bills every month right now. So I, I need the clubs to open and I need people to go back to them right. <laughs> in person. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I still imagine that, that you'll have that plus additional revenue by being able to stream. And that, would be, that would be the right. best of both worlds. I would love yeah, that. Exactly, because yeah. I would tune in for them. Yeah. Right, because I can't, you know, fly to Chicago every month, <laughs> you know, I wish sure. I could. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, even if it was a, you know, $5, you know, cover or whatever to, to be able to watch the stream, you know, that's nothing. Um, I hope people start, I mean, I understand there's, we're not, you know, it's not just the DJ industry. I've, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of industries are hurting right, right now. Um, I think half my friends were very fortunate enough to be able to work from home since the pandemic. And the other half are like me. They either work somehow in the service industry and have been just right. absolutely, you know, devastated. But I, but I hope when people can, even if it's just, you know, and I don't want to be pushy about it because that's, doesn't come mm -hmm. across well either, but um, you know, and I'm also really cognizant of, like you said, anybody can go on and start playing music, you know, just because I've done it for a really long time, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that somebody else can't play the same right. stuff. Right, but like I said, your stories and your yeah. connection, those and I got <laughs> knowledge that somebody can't replace. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, not until we get into matrix kind of stuff. <laughs> Plug that all in there. <laughs> right. I did watch Black Mirror during the, during the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that you do in um, uh, in, in music um, is your um, American Gothic Productions. Mm -hmm. um, and you, how long have you been running well, that? Well, I think I probably started using that name uh, like... I don't know, mid nineties, late nineties. Okay. Though I started DJing, you know, in clubs several years before that. Um, and that was when I started booking more and more bands and doing mm -hmm. other kind of events as, around the, the subculture. So that was American Gothic Productions is like the umbrella name for, for all the things we do for the subculture. So booking mm -hmm. concerts, parties, club nights, DJing, um, from either like movie nights and I also I run the Chicago Gothic meetup group and that's all basically under that that umbrella yeah even things like we do a gothy art sale once a year and so yeah. I mean just <laughs> it's huge too like hundreds oh, yeah. of people come by it's amazing it's so fun so yeah yeah so 
Uh, what led you to creating that? Just rather than to keep saying, I think, you know, scary lady Sarah this, scary lady mm -hmm. Sarah that. <laughs> um, and this way, if I had other people working, you know, with me at an event that I was doing mm -hmm. or another type of event. And also, gosh, I guess part of this too was um, I was running club nights. I was creating them and kind of producing them. This is going back a long time now that were not necessarily the ones I was DJing too. Like I did a, I used to do a, a monthly fetish night called Whiplash. Mm. And that was, when was that? 99 to maybe 2003, 2003, 2004. It was really successful. It was a lot of fun. It was, um, it had a way different vibe than a lot of other fetish nights out there. And it was more yep. couples than just lonely, sad men look standing around like <laughs> waiting for a, a dom to come up to them. <laughs> um, I've seen that happen. It goes, oh, yep. But, um, and since that wasn't me, you know, ex exactly, but it was my creation and I was the hostess. So I was okay. just there making things. American Gothic Productions was a good kind of umbrella term and, and lump everything together. So people kind of knew it was me, but it wasn't just like, oh, another goth night, you know? Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Um, but uh, I want to go back a little bit even further. Um, you know, obviously you're very connected with goth but you didn't start <laughs> with goth no I, i've heard you say yeah you were into punk for a long time yeah when i was a teenager um even younger really i think i went to my first punk show when i was 12 so like 1980 mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah well you remember who it was uh, the very very first one one of the one of the first ones was dead kennedy's um there was a club in chicago called cod hmm. they used to have a lot of all ages shows but my mom even though it was all ages didn't want me to go on my own because i was hmm. 12. so my stepdad went with me <laughs> and uh i remember him just sitting at the back like you know, <laughs> okay <laughs> counting it and i was like yay <laughs> so yeah, I, music, even as far back as I can remember, music has been so important to me. I mean, I, mean, I, you know, I bought my first record when I was six, you know? Yeah. I, have, I, have, I still have, it's a 45 of, <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> it's Jackson 5, <laughs> Rock and Robin. Yeah. Um, my first album was Stevie Wonder, Inner Visions, and I still love that album, start yeah. to finish now. But I found punk when I was about 12, because I used to, I used to, I found the left-hand side of the dial, really. I found all the radio stations out to the far left in the 80s, so all the college yeah. stations, which okay. absolutely was formative for me. That if I hadn't, I don't I don't know what I'd be, I you probably wouldn't be interviewing me because I would be not be into music like I am. Um, so finding those stations that played punk um, and then hardcore, you know, punk earlier and then kind of hardcore in the mid 80s was, blew my mind i was i was a i was a depressed and angry kid and that was the outlet that i didn't know i was looking for but i definitely was and the the scene in chicago back then it was pretty small mm -hmm. for a big city like chicago minuscule compared to like the hardcore scene in la for example yeah. um but so all the, like the young younger kids all the you know under 18s most of us knew each other, at least by sight, and had places that we hung out outside of gigs. And I went to, I honest to God, I'm not exaggerating, from the age of for like 14 through the age of, I don't know, from so say 1981 or two to 1987, I don't think there was, there was nary a week when I didn't, when I didn't go to at least one punk show. Okay. I was it was it was everything to me my my allowance went 100 percent to punk music to gigs and to yeah. into records yeah and um that that's why i'm gonna do a a, a punk right. stream uh, yeah. yes. as we'll uh hear in a little bit okay <laughs> um so how did how how did you end up going from punk to goth 
so the, the angry energy that I had when I was really young, when I was a kid, um, a lot of it kind of started to dissipate and I, you know, mm -hmm. kind of worked on myself and the issues I, that I was experiencing and then I had that outlet. So I became a little more introspective than outwardly rah, 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 angry. Yeah. And that was kind of a natural, the, the stations I was listening to on college radio were also then starting to play. I heard more like, I remember hearing Bauhaus and Susie mm -hmm. McGanshees and things in around the same time, but it was, I was like, oh, that's mopey adult music, you know. But when I got to be, you know, maybe like 17, 18, 19, I appreciated that more. And I, I, I was much more interested in, in poetry and, and visual art and a lot mm -hmm. of things that were more connected, um, that are more similar vein to the post-punk and, you know, I guess they didn't really call it goth yet, yeah. but that music at the time. And I remember, <laughs> so my, my personal style when I was a teenager was very much of the time, you know, I was an 80s thrift store ragtag mm -hmm. kind of, my hair was mostly, mostly red and eh, not too different than it is now to tell you the truth, but um, <laughs> as many mismatched patterns as I could yeah. find, I would wear it once, you know, yeah. never without my combo boots and my leather jacket. And then I decided to dye my hair entirely black. Well, red first, red and then black, and started wearing, instead of combat boots and ripped up tights and men's shirts and all this stuff, started wearing black form-fitting dresses and, mm -hmm. and heels. And my hair was like, and I remember very distinctly, this is, I've, I've told other people this because they will never, they'll never forget it. I was going up the stairs to a venue that we used to call the Socialist Hall, the Socialist Club here in Chicago to see Social Distortion and some local bands, I don't recall who, and I was 19 and I was going up the stairs and a friend of mine was coming down and he looked at me and he said, hey, when did you become death rock? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was very, I was startled because it didn't, it was just like a, an evolution of my personal style. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not death rock, I'm punk still. <laughs> He's like, well, you look death rock. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of thought about it, I'm like, maybe I am, what does that mean? I don't know. But I started to become more and more interested in that kind of style and music yeah. and art. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was just kind of a, a evolution with the whole scene was kind of moving that way. I mean, you know, well, the, the, with the evolution of punk into post punk. Kind of. But the punk scene, the hardcore scene in Chicago stayed. I mean, it was, right. I kind of, I kind of left it really because there were up, I think, at least in, I mean, gosh, probably later. I, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not, I don't know. But um, I think well into the 90s, the hardcore scene was kept going. And some of my friends from back then were still going to shows, punk shows mm -hmm. and things. Like I never went to, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fireside Bowl in Chicago. They mm -hmm. used to have hardcore shows there in the, in the 90s, but I never went there even once. Because yeah. I, I was in, I started, I already started DJing Goth, you know, Nocturna in 1988. So I was, um, you know, just... On the cusp of 21. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I still love and appreciate all that music. It's so important to me. But yeah, um, yeah. but my, my, so my part of my heart is still there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see um, because when this, we're recording this before the year stream, but we'll be hearing, you know, some of that punk. Yeah, I'm excited. That'd be cool. Um, I I didn't listen to a lot of punk. I've been I went to a couple of shows um, when I was at Purdue before I failed out. <laughs> um, I saw a bunch of small bands I don't even remember. It was like in basically a, a tiny like storefront, literally that was just empty. They used for <laughs> shows. Although I did get to go. Went down to Indianapolis once to see, I believe it was Seven Seconds and Circle Jerks. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah so. Many times in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so um, you transitioned from punk to goth. You started DJing, you said, in 88. Mm -hmm. So where were you DJing then? Neo. Oh, okay. Already at yeah. Neo. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And um, is, is that when you started Nocturna or is Nocturna a little bit later? Yeah. So, so Nocturna, when it started, which was 88, okay. um, Tom, brother Tom, who was mm -hmm. his DJ name, he and I had the idea together and we met with, he worked there. He had DJ there sometimes. He was a bartender mm -hmm. there and we were friends and I, we went, we had a meeting with the management and the owners and pitched them this idea and they were like, yeah, sure. So that started. And then at that time I was the hostess. <laughs> so I was uh, not DJing at the very, very, very start really mm -hmm. soon afterwards though. And it was Tom, but I would do um, random nights there. Like I did a night called scary lady Sarah's mixed bag <laughs> when it was really kind of anything and everything. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, I think when I, once I felt a little more comfortable, so God, I, I don't remember exactly when. I unfortunately don't have the notebooks anymore that I had, but several months in, mm -hmm. then I started to, to DJ as well. And then I worked at Neo as a, as a first as a um, bar back, then a bartender, cocktail waitress for a little while. I did pretty much everything there. I DJed, yeah. <laughs> cocktail waitress, bartended, bar back, uh, worked the coat check a few times. <laughs> but um he, Tom and I, since T Nocturna was every Tuesday back then, we would switch off. One week he would DJ, I would bartend, and then reverse oh. next and so on. Yeah. We did that for a long time until 96. But then, but Tom had left and moved out of town for a while anyway. So he was, he was not a part of um, Nocturna at the end of the Neo years. He moved back to Chicago. And by that time we were holding Nocturna in Smart Bar, the nightclub below Metro, mm -hmm. where we hold Nocturna now. And he'd come back um, okay. for, I have to double check, but maybe like two years, I think he came back and we we both DJed together. We'd split the night in half. Yeah. And then, then he left again and I've been doing it on my own ever since. <laughs> and um, I know that just to give a little pitch for it, there was, um, I have it here. The Neo story. Yeah. A more, uh, background of that in this. Yeah. Um, if you can go out and grab a copy of it, it's definitely worthwhile. It was. It was really well done. Yeah. 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 It was really cool. I wish it was longer. That's the only thing. I could yeah, say. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Neo was longer. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, it is. So. <clears throat> um. So I kind of want to segue now into the uh, social aspect of of all of this right so uh, i don't mean the socializing that we have but, you know it's the you know the community and all that although i guess it kind of plays in a little bit um but i've really noticed um and maybe it's just where i end up um but i noticed that a lot of djs in this scene you know the goth and industrial right uh, both kinds of music uh, uh, <laughs> often are very politically minded, socially minded, cause oriented. Um, and so I, you know, incorporate some of that here. Um, so I know for one that you are a vegan. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't um, even tell you. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, I remember several years ago, Margaret and I were in San Francisco for a conference and um, she had asked you for a recommendation for a restaurant. Oh, okay. I don't remember what the restaurant was, but it was very good. So <laughs> was it Millennium? It could be. Maybe? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it, like it. It. Yeah. it sounds like it might've been that. I don't know, but it was good. So cool. <laughs> very good. So how did you end up becoming a uh, vegan? So I was vegetarian starting in 88, which is funny, the same year as Nocturna. Um, I just, I, I had a sense, even from a young age, that animals were treated completely unfairly mm -hmm. and, and cruelly. And I, you know, I grew up eating meat and I wish it wasn't the case, but it was. Yep. But, I, but I had that little, little thing in my head, like this, this doesn't seem really right or just right and as i became a teenager and into the hardcore punk scene i became 
way more politically um, interested and, and mm -hmm. active as much as a teenager could have been. And was went to a lot of a lot of protests and things when I was when I was a kid in the in the eighties, um, and I had met some vegetarians and I met one vegan. I met my met my very first vegan uh, when I was like a sophomore in high school. And wow. yeah, yeah, this the woman named KK. I wish I knew what happened to her because she was mm. she was really cool. She was definitely a little bit of a mentor figure to me. Yeah, a couple years older. I was sixteen and she was probably like twenty one. And I'm just like, she's so cool. And it got me thinking and it, and being vegetarian, um, then I, I'll be honest, I tried to justify things to myself. Like, why did I still drink milk? I'm like, well, but they're gonna kill the cows anyways. And, gonna, and you know, why are you wearing leather boots? Well, they're gonna kill them. And little by little, these things kept falling by the wayside. I'm like, well, you know, because I would learn more. Right. Especially with the advent, I mean, of the internet, there's, there's no, way unless it's willful people don't know what actually takes place and the the people sometimes criticize vegans for using this word but i'm using the, the dictionary definition of the word holocaust it's a holocaust of, of animals daily and i it just i thought you know what i can't i can't live with myself mm -hmm. knowing what i know what i've learned right i can't square that with my own morals and my own I can't justify it anymore. So I, I cut out things as time went on. Like I remember I stopped eating dairy cheese first and that was because I learned what rennet was. Rennet is an ingredient that is in almost all dairy cheese and it's a hardening agent. But what it is, it comes from the stomach, the digestive enzymes of slaughtered animals. And mm. I thought first, because first I was like, well, dairy cows are treated fine. Well, and then I learned this, I'm like, whoa, okay, so that's not actually even technically vegetarian. And I, eh, so I cut out dairy cheese. And once I cut out cheese, that was like a quick <laughs> track to like, yep. well, if we're not eating cheese, I don't need to eat butter. I don't need to eat, you know, our gelatin is so disgusting. Anyway, what do you know? It's like, oh, it comes from boiled bones. That's disgusting. So yeah. And, and, uh, May 1st, 1999 is when I officially was like, that's it, I got rid of the leather and things that I wore. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, even though this is this product already exists, this thing, it's someone's skin. And I don't want to show, I don't want to wear it and, mm -hmm. and have people think that I'm thinking of this as a material, because it's not a material, it's someone's skin, it's dead, it's someone who got, you know, someone yeah. innocent who was killed. And um, so yeah, May 1st, 1999, Best decision I ever made in my entire life. Yeah. Um, never look back. Yeah, vegan for life. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been vegetarian since. Um, I've always said it was like January 1990, but then I found the article that really convinced me to become vegetarian uh, from Spin Magazine. Oh. Uh, I believe came out in 1991. So it was around then that I went vegetarian, but I, I never went fully vegan. Um, yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I, I've, I'm comfortable in the fact that, um, I've been vegetarian for 30 years and that I, that alone has made an impact. Obviously, you don't want me to say what I, I'm going to say. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> the, um, the, the dairy industry is more cruel. Yeah. More cruelty is involved in the dairy industry than in any other animal agriculture industry. Well, I I don't consume a lot of dairy uh, because I'm lactose intolerant. Of course, because you're uh, not a baby cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's just some things like pizza. Um, I eat pizza all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I get no. <laughs> but no, maybe maybe once I'm back in Chicago, uh, where there there are more options. I mean, I still live in the South. You, you have Whole Foods in Charleston. We do, not very close by though. Okay, you got the internet. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I know. Um, anyway, <laughs> like you asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's fair. It's fair. Um, but um, I mean, I, I totally agree, you know, with the, this 
I always thought it was wrong, you know, weird to eat some animals and not others. Like, right. right. It's like, why is it okay to eat a cow, but not a dog? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, like my mom, um, she had a pet pheasant when she was a kid because she oh, wow. grew up partially on a farm. Okay. Um, and so she would never eat pheasant, hmm. but that's it. That's the only thing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I had, um, it still haunts me uh, as a child. Um, my stepdad gave my mom a boa constrictor as a pet. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is cool. I love snakes, <laughs> but they eat mice and rats. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and since we just had a small fish tank for it, um, we couldn't put the rats in there live because it, it, there just wasn't enough space for the, the boa to actually, you know, act like it would in, in, you know, in the natural world. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was tasked with having to kill the mice. Um, yeah. So I had to put them in Mason jars. I hated it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that was kind of one of the first things that led me to to being vegetarian. Um, yeah, uh, I, I I say I'm almost vegan. Almost. Kind of like being almost pregnant, though. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. You we can do on it from that subject. You can then. do it, Dave. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife's still not vegetarian. Hmm. so yeah maybe she'll uh, jump on board when you when you yeah, show up well, she, it is. she is mostly vegetarian okay see so that i that i can say people can be mostly vegetarian but okay. the vegan is like eh, yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> um so one of the things that uh, to kind of segue away from that for <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> uh that we, we talked about a little bit before um before we started recording this um in in terms of music and how that plays a role. Hmm. Um, now, of course, with with animals, we you know you know we've got Skinny Puppy. Um, yeah, that's you know kind of legendary for that. And mm -hmm. um, and and Howard Jones, I remember was uh, was an influence on the person that influenced me to be a vegetarian. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but what you were talking about earlier was the. Um, gender diversity in in music right and that you try to play some more balanced representation right i do because it's music is is still pretty male dominated mm -hmm. you know a, lo a lot of aspects of it are not all but but most i would say really and even in in the genres of music that that I play, um, the post punk and goth and dark wave, it's it's definitely industrial too. It's, I it's it would be very kind of easy to do a whole entire night's worth of DJing and like oh mm -hmm. I didn't play any female vocals, so you have to, I, to me anyway. I, I I would I really want that representation, not only because I'm a woman too, but I just think it's it's just more fair and, yeah. and um, representative of you know what's out there. Um, I do a shoegaze night too, which I've been doing right. for many years um, now with uh, my co-DJ Philly Proxide for ten years. I can't believe it. <laughs> it was like ten when we started out. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he's such a big I love him. But um, in that, it's it's a little easier. There are more female vocals. It's a little more. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to think about it as as much like okay what what woman am i going to play next because it's right. represented more but yeah you know, god the, the, the this kind of stereotypical goth sound which thankfully there's much more diversity now but there's still a lot of bands who really 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 like sisters of mercy <laughs> and really want to sound like them or joy division or the cure mm -hmm. and those are all male vocals so you've got the the most influential bands right are, it's like wow so yeah so you have to I have to put, put a little more thought into making sure that i that 
my sets are, are more balanced. Yeah. That too. yeah. Of course, you know, we've got Susie. Yeah. As yeah, a, of course. As an influence, but, the queen. <laughs> but you know, that's, it's, it is definitely weighted much more heavy on the male yeah. side. You think of like the top, you know, the right. main four runners of, of, for fathers, <laughs> I guess, of, of yeah. fathers. You know, Bauhaus, Sisters, the Cure, Nephilim, Mission, you know, the, the big bands that kind of got mm -hmm. even bigger than just the goth scene. Yeah. And then there's Susie. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not about that well balanced. Um, so do you see more women getting into it these days? Or, or maybe just discovering more? I think in the, the audience is pretty balanced. There's yeah. definitely, uh, as far as artists go, there's a decent number. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, I don't think there, there are, there's still more male mm -hmm. bands and male fronted bands out there for sure, by far. But there's a decent number. Yeah. I wish there were more. Um, maybe there's more, I just don't know them yet, but I hope yeah, I can I, out. I mean, I haven't taken a survey in or anything, but it, it seems that it's growing. It's mm -hmm. certainly not balanced, but I, I think there is, there's overall just generally more representation yeah. across the board, right. not just, you know, in gender, but um, in, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so that's a good thing. And, and and, and going back to, you know, Twitch and being able to, you know, play stuff that's not necessarily, you know, for the dance floor, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not, you're not, that's, that's not necessarily the goal uh, is, you know, keeping the dance floor going, right? right? Um, so you can, so you can bring in more new stuff uh, for people to check out and, yeah. and, and expose people to definitely female-led bands and um, and even, you know, trans women or, you know, uh, people of color and all that kind of stuff. It's, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, just gotta, it's, 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 it's hard to find, but once you start, it, it kind of steamrolls a little bit, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, right. So. I, 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 it's nice to see, and I, I mean, I'm only seeing it really because of you know, the internet, I suppose, mm -hmm. and now, but more and more representation of like African Americans in goth, in the goth scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely been dominated by white faces, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and in certain cities, maybe less so. Others in, in Chicago, we've always had a pretty decent Latino um, patron, patronage mm -hmm. at Nocturna. Um, but band wise, yeah, there's. I it would. I'd be. I'd be totally. I think it would be cool to see more people yeah. of color making the music. Am Americans, I would say, because there's loads and loads. Oh God, there's so many bands that are like mm -hmm. from South America and Mexico, and yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot of music coming from around the world. Yeah. Yeah. I was amazed that like Russia's post punk scene is like mm. wow. This seems apparently huge. Yeah. All the new bands coming out. Yeah. I even know a couple I played last night, um, an Indonesian <laughs> post punk yeah. band, you know. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, like there's um I I'm, I guess they're more industrial. Um Hatari, I think. Is yeah, their sure. Name? Icelandic. Yeah. Right. Um and they do a song with um uh, I can't remember the exact name, um, but He's Middle Eastern. Um, oh, it's, yeah, it's really, let me see. I have it written down, I know. Uh, do, 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 do. Or maybe I don't. Uh, no, I don't have it. Uh, anyway, um, I'll think of it later and type it in chat. Um, but yeah, I get that song stuck in my head all the time, even though I have no idea what they're saying. Um, it's just really cool. Um, it's and it's it, you've got this extremely aggressive um, uh, Icelandic 
singer that it, it kind of reminds me uh, a little bit of Osiko. Okay. Um, and then you've got um, this uh, Middle Eastern person. I, I'd have to look to see where he's from. Um, but then singing very differently, right? Um, but the way that meshes together is just so cool. Um, so that, that's something to check out anyway, is, uh, I wish I could think of it. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of great, uh, music out there. Um, I discover a lot, um, from, you know, just a variety of DJs. Um, I would recommend, uh, MP3J Sark. Um, he intentionally plays, uh, um, a diversity of music. Um, so I've discovered, um, and he mentioned it and, and played it later on. Um, a band called Backwash. Okay. It's Back X Wash. And it's, it's described by the, the singer as dark wave hardcore hip hop. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she is a black trans um, singer doing. Uh, sampling metal, rapping, um, and singing about like occult stuff. Oh wow! Okay, it is. So that yeah, sounds unique. It's awesome. It just th check it out. Um, oh, well, I, I'm sure you know some of it will definitely fit. Um, actually, some of it might fit in the punk night, but I don't know. Uh, maybe not. I mean, it depends on how how widely you uh, define punk. Uh, you know. For this stream, I'm doing the punk of my youth. Okay. So I'm actually playing like stuff that I have on record yeah. on actual vinyl, but I don't have turntables. So I'm playing the digital yeah. versions of them. But right. yeah, so kind of a little more narrow parameters for this, but that sounds yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, d definitely there's more out there. I th that's why I'm saying I think there is, um, there is definitely a growing uh, diversity um, yeah. and, and I think, you know, just keep looking and you'll, you're going to find more. For sure. Um, and, and that's great. Um, you know, it's, um, I think anything that the DAs can do to normalize diverse representation is good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause that's, you know, kind of, uh, we do something that we're trying to do where I teach, um, you know, in business, I teach entrepreneurship. Entrepreneur is extremely white male biased, right? Mm -hmm. And when you think the word entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, it's usually, you know, uh, a white man that lives out in the West Coast that, you know, comes to mind. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to change that. Um, I'm trying to change the whole perception of what entrepreneurship is in general. I don't know that I'll be able to change the world on that, but I can change a few minds. Yeah. Um, and so I've been trying to convince DJs that they're entrepreneurs, that they at least act entrepreneurially. Mm -hmm. um, because what, you know, what a lot of people describe of what they do or how they got to where they were was by trying little experiments, having a night, here and there, trying different things, seeing what works, what worked, they stick with it and build from there. And that is the lean startup movement. Sure. Um, and, the, and the reason why I think it's, it's valuable for DJs to, to think of themselves as entrepreneurs is that there are a lot of resources for entrepreneurs, whereas there aren't a whole lot out there for people in the service industry. Right. Um, so I'm trying to advocate for for people to reach out to those entrepreneurial communities um, to just see what there might be out there to help, uh, particularly, you know, in these days right now. Um, like there will be in every town just about there is a um, there's a weekly meetup called um, One Million Cups by the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, cup as in coffee cup. Okay. Um, and it's basically, 
each week, um, it's usually somebody is just pitching an idea uh, and everyone there provides some feedback. Hmm. Um, so it's an opportunity to meet people in all kinds of industries. Cause a lot of the people there will, will end up being like um, marketing or accounting or, you know, you know, kind of trying to sell their services. Um, but it is, you know, kind of a hodgepodge of different industries and you never know what kind of connection you might be able to make from that. Right. So, sure. um, so that's one of my little missions is to cool. get, you know, everybody here to think that they're entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm also, um, I, I teach social entrepreneurship and I'm trying to get them to redefine social entrepreneurship as, in fact, we were just talking about it today. Um, the consensus definition from the class was um, getting people together to make lasting change. That's extremely broad. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that's great. I'm obviously, I'm, I'm in favor of inclusivity instead what? of exclusivity. Um, so the, the broader I can define something, the better. Mm. So I don't, I'm kind of going on a side tangent because. Oh, that's your field. Uh, an entrepreneurship. Um, uh, and, but you are much more of an entrepreneur than some of the others because you have the AGP, right? That, as a business and you owned um the flotation yeah flotation thing. tanks Flota yeah. <laughs> yeah flotation tanks uh, i never did get to try those uh, they're cool well yeah. we we may reopen we'll see what happens with the state of things yeah how did you get into because that obviously seems very non-goth no except well, that maybe you're in the dark i don't know <laughs> i used to always joke that i had I had both the loudest job, DJ in a nightclub, mm -hmm. and the quietest job, flotation tanks. Um, it kind of fell into it. It was something that going, this is going way back, um, 1991, uh, my ex-husband and I were still quite good friends, so, but he, he and his uh, old roommate, college roommate, used to go to the place and float and loved it and found out that the current own, the owners were going to close it and move out of town. And we kind of talked it out and hashed it out. And we always joke to, we used to joke back then that like, well, we needed a job and so we bought one. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, the three of us purchased it together and he, the, his old roommate left after a few years, moved to the West Coast and, and he and I ran it for 24 years and then they sold the building and knocked the building down. And so we've been in this long, very drawn out and very uh, fraught with awful yeah. <laughs> pitfalls uh, story of, of trying to reopen at a new location. But I, we'll see. I try not to think about it too much because it does my head in. But, right. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's, been, it's been five years since that happened. Oh, and, yeah. and so the last five years had been literally just DJing mm. as my job yeah. so yeah throughout the the 90s having the float center was fantastic because it actually afforded me the opportunity to book loads of bands for example that I never would have been able to to take a risk on and yeah that. so so floating kind of uh subsidized the goth scene in Chicago whether people floating, know floating that. Your business. <laughs> exactly or your your you know the the other business so, so um, I don't know where do you where do you see things going forward in terms of um, it can either be in terms of how music is evolving um, or just like what the scene will be like post pandemic. Yeah, well, I mean, post pandemic, all I can do is hope. <laughs> you know, I I think. I think back to you know, the previous biggest pandemic, you know, the mm -hmm. Spanish flu and what happened afterwards, we had the roaring 20s. So there was this resurgence of, of, of you know, social life and society yeah. and, and art and um, nightlife. 
And I'm hoping that this yeah. 21st century yeah. version of that experiences the, the same thing that's resurgence. And it can go either way. It can go either people are so used to staying in and feel mm -hmm. fulfilled with the electronic, you know, the digital connections that they have that they're like, hey, don't need to go out. I'll save money. I'll stay in. I don't have to get dressed. <laughs> but it could also be that people are just so hungry for it, like me, yeah. <laughs> and really just want to give it their all and come back out and make such an effort. And on Facebook, we have the Nocturna Chicago group. Mm -hmm. I don't know, about 5,000 or so people. And they're not all of them are people who have been to Nocturna, but I think most of them have at least once in their life actually attended. And the sense I get from the little bit of feedback is that people, at least people are saying that, oh, I can't wait. I'm never going to miss another one because mm -hmm. <laughs> now I know what it's like not to have it. Right. Oh, I sure hope that's that's the case and not yeah. the other way. <laughs> well, I can I can say from the perspective of not having it, because once we moved to Charleston, we didn't have it. Yeah. So when we go uh, to Chicago, it is mostly involving going out yeah. <laughs> every night, no matter what. <laughs> so uh, yeah, like um, a year and a half ago for my 50th birthday, it was cold waves. Mm. So it was four nights of cold waves yeah. plus my birthday, which was the day after cold waves. Uh, so five nights of going out and having fun because awesome. you know, we could do that here, but it's just not, you know, it's, it, Charleston is a very different town. Mm. You know, we don't have a huge goth group here and they're all younger. Yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> it's weird being called an elder. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Okay. I guess I shouldn't. Um, be surprised given you know this <laughs> but I, I still don't think of myself as elder oh, I guess. oh my god right? no I don't either uh, but I mean, compared to them yeah they're, they're youngins you yeah. <laughs> know I mean if you even think back when we were kids 50s then and 50s now it, it isn't it just literally isn't the same thing right well people take better care of themselves and live more mm -hmm. active lives and and our, you know, our, there is something to the fact that, you know, our scene keeps you kind of young too, because it's, yeah. it's a, it, you know, it started in your youth, but I don't know. I wouldn't, I don't mind being 53 at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it yeah, it I, kind of surprises me once in a while when someone's like, oh, my mom's your age. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> of course, of course they are, but it's, it's, I don't think yeah. like that. Until or, or when you get the AARP, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I was like, really? <laughs> uh, well, I, I called my, my birthday celebration, my first half century. Yes, absolutely. Cause there's no reason why you can't leave another. Right. Years. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the way I approached it. Um, yeah. It's midlife. Yeah. Right. It's supposed to be. Right. It's midlife. not the end of life. Yeah, they yeah. call it midlife crisis and you know, but <laughs> not a crisis, but yeah. you know, <laughs> Anyway, I I see like both. I see um, I see people definitely returning, but I also see people you know having gotten comfortable with this and continuing that. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be both, right? People can do both, right? You can go to the club, and then the you know the next night you're watching a club in you know in Germany, right? Right. You know, yeah. Or, you know so. I think, well, for one, I think, you know, we've been spoiled this last year um, with the access to music from around the world. Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches with all the DJs. Um, it it's, makes it so hard to pick, like, who to watch on a night. <laughs> I, I always feel bad uh, about not watching somebody. Sure. It's like, I, you know, I, I kind of want to like open up like 10 tabs and just leave the volume at <laughs> just because apparently you have to have the volume on to count as a viewer. Oh. So if you, if you get that, if you can get that slider just, you know, at the point zero one, you know, yeah. level, um, then it's, you know, you're listening, but you know, giving, getting them the credit, um, 
but yeah, it's, it's tough. And so I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of people that are, you know, going to be wanting that and you can't do Nocturna um, seven days a week. No, right? you can't <laughs> do shows, you know, all that often. Um, and it, in one part, it's because there will, there are going to be fewer venues. Yeah. Right. So there's going to be more competition yeah. for using that space. So that's going to be interesting to see, um, you know, like those venues that survive, um, you know, if their rates are going to go up, it's going to be more difficult. Um, I don't know. One of these days I'm going to have to interview one of the venue owners. Um, but it's, it, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm, I'm very fortunate that Metro where I do mm -hmm. Nocturna, my, my main club night is in a, in a position that they're not in danger of closing. Okay. Exactly. Um, now, even though I'm their longest resident DJ there in their entire 38 year history, mm -hmm. it's 38 years now. Um, I, I am also very, very keenly aware that I am low man on the, when it comes to booking, you know, so I get my nocturna dates, but sometimes I don't get my first choice. Sometimes uh, they, yeah. they've got a concert coming through, mm -hmm. a, a touring band that's going to sell out, which is 1,100 people. Guess who gets bumped? Yeah. This girl. <laughs> so, but, but they, you know, we work it out. We work it yeah. out. But I know there's going to be this glut of tours once things are able to to open it back up so oh yeah we'll, we'll see what yeah. happens my my monthly shoegaze night shimmer is at a much 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 smaller venue and i haven't heard really any a peep out of them so mm. i don't i am crossing my fingers that they make it through this and reopen it's just a little night and we don't get a massive crowd we get as many or more people actually probably more people <laughs> tuning into the to shimmer online which is yeah bizarre um but it's something that's personally really fulfilling to me and to, to my co-dj philly peroxide too so yep. we, we love shoegaze music so much and to be able to play it there in that you know loud and big and we've got all kinds of cool visuals and things happening um it would it would be really sad if if they shot i hope they don't i don't know if, yeah yeah i like i said i think you know some will be i mean it's just yeah. and i'm sure some have already Oh yeah, um, we've lost. But that Chicago. also provides opportunity to open up something. Have you thought about opening your own? That has been the. I mean, to be honest, the one goal, business goal that I've had in my life that I have not been able to achieve, and I've come, I've come close to it a few times, yeah. but many years ago now. So, um, Eric, who is my first ex-husband, <laughs> who were the one who were still friends when we owned the flotation center together. Mm -hmm. Um, we, at two occasions, were very close to opening. Um, I don't know if, if you were in Chicago during these times. There used to be a club on Lincoln Avenue called Europa or Europia, Europia, okay. Lincoln and Diversity. When they closed, it was an old funeral home, the building. Mm. It was so cool. Yeah. And they were closed and dormant for a couple of years. And we were going to buy it and open a club. We were in a decent enough position to be able to do this. This is going back though. This is like 90, 95. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there yet. The first time. Yeah. And we had to, we were told by um, the alderman who we approached about the licenses, licensing we would need. Well, you have to go to our neighborhood meeting and, t and pitch your idea and see mm -hmm. what their feedback is. Well, the neighborhood did not like the idea of us opening a nightclub there, <laughs> even though there had been one. Yeah. And basically told us in no uncertain terms, if you try to go this, we will complain enough, make enough noise to the alderman that he will not grant you this license. Mm -hmm. And go ahead and try, but this is what's going to happen. Yeah. And we were not willing to put the money down to buy this property and go through all the trouble right. to then find out we couldn't get granted licenses that we needed to run the business. And then another... Uh, <laughs> case was did, did you remember uh what the hell was it called oh bloody hell 
never mind. I can't remember the name, but there was a clever. So at Halsted near on Halsted between just a few blocks north of Division in Chicago. What the fuck was the name of that club? Ah, there was a club there for a long time, but right across the street was that another. Was no, no, that was in Lincoln Park. I can't yeah, remember what this is okay. called, but the yeah, but regardless, um, another building that was for sale that we thought that would be great. There were no, it was more of a an industrial area, so not mm -hmm. a lot of tenants, not a lot of residents to complain to right. an alderman. So we went after looking at that. We had the money for the down payment on the building, and then we had it. We found out through a surveyor it had been a manufacturing building at some point in the far past mm. but we had to check it out and they did a survey and they found it in the basement were buried some tanks some tankards and mm. they didn't know what it was in could have been empty could have been nothing but we had to enable to get the license to sh to prove that it wasn't anything harmful mm -hmm. for the public we had to excavate that that would have been twenty five thousand dollars just for the excavation mm. and the survey and to find out maybe we, we wouldn't allow us to open. And again, right. we couldn't, we couldn't risk, yeah. we just couldn't risk it. That you'd have so that, to do a toxic yeah. cleanup or something. Right, yeah, there was no or way. Or maybe um, an age old murder investigation or something. Yeah, yeah. you never know. Yeah. <laughs> so so since then, um, and now with with space, the, the fleet flotation tank center um, not being around to foot a lot of the finances for these mm. things, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's still an idea, but it's on the, far 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 back burner <laughs> yeah. i would absolutely love to though i have no illusions though that i know that this time period i it, i couldn't open something of the scale i was looking to before mm -hmm. i just don't think there's enough people that go out to sustain that now but even something small that yeah. would that would still be yeah that that's something i, I never gave up the idea but yeah. um don't have the resources right now <laughs> well you know don't forget about crowdsourcing True, true. Um, we're, we're, we've, we did crowdsourcing for actually for the float center to reopen. Mm -hmm. And then we had through a, a little bit of our own fault and then a lot of stuff I won't get into, but not our fault. Things just didn't work out. And so we have still quite a few justifiably unhappy people who pitched in. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting for this to, to happen. And we'll, yeah. we'll, again, it's, it's not, it's not, We'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they got to select the right platform. Mm. You know, some of them will take the money. Some of them don't take the money until something is actually started. Yeah. So, but yeah. this was Indiegogo. Was it? Okay. Yeah. So um, I think we're coming up close to the end here. Um, so I want to um, ask one final question. Sure. Which is what gives you hope? What gives me hope? Yeah, in general, hope. <laughs> hope. I I think. Okay. Well, this this year with the pandemic, it it has been awful in many ways, but it has also been tremendously life affirming. And some others, you know, people are actually coming out and standing up for their beliefs and mm -hmm. and less bullshit is being tolerated <laughs> you know people are being called out on things right. I, I i am not super excited about our new government in the united states but i am super glad it's not what we had so there's a little hope the last four years was yeah. like a waking nightmare every day it's like <laughs> how the fuck is this guy president <laughs> so that's very hopeful yeah. um i wish it wasn't another incredibly old white man but whatever yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> let's say what could have been bernie then i would have been okay. yes yeah uh -huh. he's a cool old white man. um yeah and you know it's part like my some of my my personal um causes and and cares i'm very very excited and happy about the spread of um veganism and animal the awareness of, of mm -hmm. animal cruelty and how people are just, I mean, vegan, used, I used to be able to have to explain to a person what vegan meant. Now, everybody knows what vegan means, you know? Yeah. So it's awesome. Um, Music-wise, 
the immense exposure and, and outreach that bands can have without a label is amazing. You know, with Bandcamp, for example, mm -hmm. or, or just the internet in general, it's great. So bands that may not have, that deserve to and may not have had an audience before now right. can, that's really great. So yeah, there's good stuff. I'm hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of an eternal optimist anyway. So oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. <laughs> that's so, very cloth of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's a kind of question we can talk about at some other point is, you know, what uh, I was watching another stream talking about what is goth. Um, yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I think they would say that, that being an optimist is goth. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. It's just, it's just that, that cliche of like, just yeah. like oh. <laughs> <laughs> everything's doomed. <laughs> uh, but for now we're going to um, go punk. Um, so, um, <laughs> we finish this here in a minute and uh, we will raid your channel and hear some, some classics uh, from years ago that influenced you um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I didn't listen to a lot um, and I, you know kind of wish I had heard more so I'm 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 interested to be educated about more cool. um, more punk All so right. thank you for taking the time to speak with me Oh, thank you. I appreciate it so much. And thank you for being the, the hype train conductor so many times, too. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. All right.